Many thanks to you, Yemi Ajayi, for the background report. And we have our guests all seated here in the studio. So let me start with the uh, introductions. Uh, Dr. Otive Ibuza is, uh, uh, of course, a former deputy chief of staff to former uh, deputy president of the Senate. Uh, he's also a leading civil society activist of many years, uh, with many years' experience. Um, one of the committee of academics put together by the Honorable Minister of Information and National Orientation, drawn from various sectors to fine tune and perfect the National Lifestyle Charter, which will soon be unveiled by the President. And he joins us live in the studio right now. Uh, Dr. Ebuza, thank you very much for joining it's us. It's my pleasure. All right. And also, also joining okay. us is Dr. Danladi Bako, the Koguna of Saokoto, former Director General, National Broadcasting Commission, and former Commissioner of Information, Saokoto State, and also a veteran journalist. Dr. Danladi, you are welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, still here is uh, uh, Mr. Osita Okechuku, former Director General, Voice of Nigeria. You're welcome, sir. Good morning, Nigeria. Okay. Let, let's, let's just uh, kickstart... Uh, our conversation this morning towards reinventing uh, Nigeria, which requires both active uh, citizen participation and accountable leadership, going by the, uh, the report there. In the midst of severe recession, business, bankruptcy, and unemployment, J.F. Kennedy called on Americans to provide civic action and public service to the nation. How did he summon courage to do that? And how can our leaders also take a cue from this, Dr. Ibuza? Yeah, um, in the development of any country, you require both government, elected leaders, people in position of authority doing something, and citizens doing some things. And um, over the years, like I said, in the uh, John Kennedy call rallied on people to do certain things in order to bring the country out of problems. Uh, in Nigeria, here, there has been challenges over the years, and um, leaders have also made a clarion call on citizens. Uh, we don't have any other country but Nigeria. We must stay here and salvage it together. There was ethical revolution. You know, there was clarion call that Nigeria, we are a great nation, great people. There is a war against the indiscipline. And recently, there is also the change begins with me. But one basic problem with all of this is that in most cases, it's called on citizens. And citizens are not seeing what government is giving in return. I think that's why there is this new move by the administration, which you mentioned during your introduction, to set up the National Values Committee to fine tune what is called seven for seven. Seven core promises by government to citizens, and seven commitment by citizens so that the clarion call will not be on one side. side. Will not be one sided. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, Demola. I, I would like to start our conversation on another pedestal. Uh, since we're talking about you know patriotism and reinventing the spirit of patriotism in Nigerians, we the Super Eagles have a national assignment today. So I like our guests to share you know, their perspectives. What, what do you all think? Let me start with uh, uh, the, 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 of course, um, uh, the I traditional think. leader here, yes. <laughs> what do you think? Well, what do I think yes. about whether they will win or whether... Yes. Well, I mean, um, good morning again, Nigerians uh, and those watching all over the world. The Super Eagles have uh, gotten better right from the first match to what we have today. And um, they represent uh, a cosmopolitan team that uh, tends to reflect 
the capacities of all of us as Nigerians. And uh, the mere fact that they strode, had to fight hard to survive some of those matches showed the spirit of the Nigerian, capacity to overcome adversity and capacity to forge in one direction and uh, to work for each other. Uh, as we got along, the team got better with cohesion and uh, everybody seemed to play for each other and for the country. I think um, the last few games, the last two particularly, we have seen more energy, more effort, more cohesion, more unity, more focus, more purpose. And in that light, I think that um, they're a true reflection of what we should be doing as Nigerians, um, irrespective of whether Abdullahi Yusuf is from whatever part of the north or whether Charles, uh, whether Calvin Bassi is from whatever part, or in fact, uh, Mbamali, the goalkeeper, whatever. Nobody cares where he comes from. Nobody even cares uh, whether Demola Lukman is from Ogun State or from Kwara State mm. or from Lagos State. Everybody just wants to see a team. In fact, if you ask, a lot of them don't have an idea where Zaidu Sanusi comes from. They don't have an idea where uh, Alex Iwobi comes from. Some mm. of them will say Alex Iwobi probably is Southeast and yet he's Delta. So all, we know those things, but we have watched them abandon their little cleavages and provincial and ethnic things. And uh, I'll tell you one story that once upon a time, in 1992, I was in our trip to Cote d'Ivoire. We were playing Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, there was a goal that needed to be scored, Samson Siasia and Yas Rashidi Yakini. And Siasia refused to pass the ball to Yakini, mm -hmm. and it became a tribal issue. Hmm. People took it up that because he's Yoruba, mm -hmm. that this person refused to pass ball to him. Mm -hmm. We've seen so many teams in the past. I know I can count three occasions I was doing commentary, and uh, the ball was supposed to be given to somebody, but because they felt there was this little fractious relationship. Uh, so the team we've seen now, they refused, he refused to give the ball to that person, and we lost those matches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I can go mm -hmm. on. The list yeah. is endless of lack of harmony, lack of purpose, lack of uh, a value system that makes you put Nigeria first. In the I bottom line, all of this says that the way the team has performed so far, nobody cares where they're coming from, and they have forged ahead, and I believe that eventually, whenever Super Eagles score a goal, anytime, wherever in this country, you'll hear noise from the neighborhood. People will scream irrespective of whether they are from uh, Uzuakoli or whether they are from Guadabawa yeah. or wherever they are from. People, you know, people enjoy the national team. You know, we I, must all strive to be like the national team. You know, I, we're not discussing the match, yeah. uh, but there's a, a lot of lessons yeah. that we could draw that resonates with our topic today. And that's why I'm going to go back to the, the former D, DG. Um, in, in some of the videos, you know, uh, trending, we saw even Ahmed Musa in the bus, you know, also leading, you know, song. And th th that, you know, leads me to my question, you know, which is what I, I wanted us to talk about. The, the evaluation of the patriotism quotient of, of Nigerians, what does, what does, I mean, the current uh, uh, super egos, what they do, what does it, what does it tell us? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, as Kogna said, super egos uh, is the epitome of the Nigeria we dream about. Where impunity is not in the forefront, where the cleavages and fault lines of ethnicity is latent and not promoted. I think they represent that. And uh, we are also praying that the local league should also emulate the super egos. And we Nigeria as well should emulate their patriotism, their oneness, their common humanity, because as your topic said, uh, reinventing is appropriate because Nigeria is well endowed, body human and material resources. All we need is to reinvent ourselves, to be in a position to, like the coach would do. This man is best fitted to play number nine the other one is best suited to play number 10. The other one is best suited to be the goalkeeper. Without minding whether or where he comes from or whichever religion, mm -hmm. they only mind as well 
that uh, records have that at 99% of the people adore the religion where they were born. That as kids, as Muslims, you are taken to Muslim schools. As Christians, you are taken to Christian schools. And 99 will not leave being Christians or Muslims throughout their life. So you cannot hold anybody responsible to the religion where he belongs or responsible for the tribe. Because we are not the one that chose to be born. I didn't choose to be born in Enugu State. Because <laughs> I did not choose to be born in uh, Sokoto. Not Dr. Edward, to choose to be born in Delta. So we just found ourselves he found himself in Delta, I found myself in Enugu. To hold it against me would be a misnomer. It happens all over the world, but the minimal, the reduction of our impunity is what we should look for. Where you are made a president of the country, instead of looking for the files of police officers, you are first looking for a trans man to be the head of the police or the head of the army. The day we'll get over that, look at Biden in the US. He, he made a choice that baffled even his opponents. He looked and made an inclusive, because inclusion is at the hallmark of human growth. If you develop inclusion, equity, and fairness, it then means that the followership will go with you. Nigerians uh, were good followers. When they tell us that uh, this president is coming, is going to be good, we we'll follow him. But it becomes bad when the president starts doing something differently from what the people hoped he will achieve, or the governor, or the local council chairman down the line. Mm -hmm. So the super egos is their pitum. We should emulate as a country. You, 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 want, you, you want to share your perspective. How, what, what experience about you know, the, the level of patriotism you know, of Nigerians at, the, at this point in time? I, I think You've had any experience? Yeah, I think that when you see Nigerians at football, um, like what uh, Danla de Bakwe has said, you know, that's what it should be. Because every Nigerian will key into it. And patriotism is love for one's country. Historically, the average Nigerian has a lot of love for his country. And that is why there are many people, in spite of the challenges that the country is going through and has gone through over the years, there are many people who have, you know, opportunities to go to other places, but they will not leave Nigeria. Hmm. When I was, uh, I was country director of Action Aid, after being country director, I was appointed international head of campaigns of Action Aid. And I had two options of where to stay, either in the United Kingdom or uh, London, United Kingdom, or Johannesburg in South Africa. I chose Abuja, which was not on, on the, the table. List. And the headquarters was moved to Abuja. Why did you do that? Because, because you had all the comforts. I yeah, mean, yeah. All, no, because yeah. I love Nigeria. I can't stay anywhere else. Okay. You know, you know, the things we see in Nigeria, because life is not just about comfort. Mm -hmm. Life is about relationship. Life is about connections, interactions with people. You go to London, you know, you go to work, you come back. You know, ah, we visit there mm -hmm. quite often. We see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, so what I'm trying to say is that many Nigerians have love for the country, okay. but over the years, this love has waned for several reasons, including poor political leadership, poor governance, the fact that. Many people, people have seen people display that love, discipline, commitment, honesty, and they see them suffer. Hmm. So, over the years, you see there's moral degeneration. And that's why I think that reinventing Nigeria is critical. 
And the way to reinvent Nigeria is to go back to the fundamentals of national values. Because, you know, many of us growing up in the village, we saw people who were not opulently rich, but were well respected. And they become your role models. And you want to live like them. But today, all those have been uh, eroded. However, and I think this is the critical point, in spite of all the challenges, there are certain unique characteristics about Nigerians. Dignity of labor, resilience, anywhere you see Nigeria. That's why you see that Nigerians go to many parts of the country and they do well and succeed. They, don't, they do not just do well. They, they take excel. up leadership positions. They excel. So, the enabling environment must be created for that to happen. And that is the social contract between those in position of authority and yeah, the, the citizens. Government and the life. So yeah. that that core that <clears throat> fuels patriotism will continue. And I think that is why yeah. the new National Values Charter that is being under consideration is quite different from the rest in that it has both the seven core promises by government and the seven commitments by we'll the one of which yes, is patriotism. Yes, we will look at that uh, in depth. Yes. We'll look at it later. Uh, continue. Uh, but you, one thing that you talked about is the social contract, which is very germane when we are talking about reinventing Nigeria. And Dr. Bako, you, you, you said something when you were talking about the egos, that you know the level of cohesion the team spirit and all that. And uh, we also realized that, you know, though we lost in 1992, but in 1994, the game changed because we had this team spirit. They were able to identify you know, the players that are very important and they were the players that they were chosen. And we won in 1994 up to 1996. And Nigerians were back together again. Now, in the light of that, how do we now begin to reinvent Nigeria? With what areas should our leaders, you know, concentrate on? Thank you, uh, Dimola. In the first instance, the hiatus or the absence of a bridge between leadership and followership, Dr. Ibuzo attempted to, you know, foray into that vacuum. Uh, has grown wider over the years. And because it has grown wider, there's a gap in the mentality of those that are growing up today that are under 2030. Demola, in university, I was privileged to share a room. In 1974, we shared a room, two of us in a room. Today, we have eight, ten people in a room. Mm -hmm. In my university days, I, I shared a room with a medical student called David Sinotiotio. I didn't have an idea where he came from. I didn't have an idea. And whenever I went to collect my scholarship, I literally shared my scholarship with him. Because as a medical student, he needed to buy so many more things. Find Gray's Anatomy book, here, this, <laughs> that. And we were getting a lot of money. So we could sit back. He also, when his friends come, they, and we forgot about ethnicity completely i was part of demonstrations from 74 to 78 every year we had alimos go kunle adepeju akintunde ojo nigeria's uh, whatever for apartheid south africa to support anc 75 i was right there mm. all of us that marched on the street didn't have an idea where the next person was coming from whether he was from uh, aaron dizogu mm. or whether he was from kafinsoli in katrina or from uh, chanchanga we marched in purpose in unity mm. those days irrespective of the fact that there were provincial leaders whether it was a Madubello in the north or Awolo in the southwest and uh, Namdizazikiwe and Opara in the southeast, they had a common purpose to build a Nigeria. Go and read all the speeches, speeches at independence, speeches at the House of Assembly, speeches at the House <laughs> of Chiefs. All those speeches contained the unity of purpose of Nigerians. Demola, what will shock you is that 
because of the kind of leadership they had, the, almost all of them were poor by the time they were dying. Mm. I search around Sokoto every day, and I'm looking for the house Amadou Bello built. And till today, what I see is a very small building. Mm -hmm. I grew up from age five, seeing President Shagari mm -hmm. on my, my house, family house is about 50 meters from, you know, about 100 meters from President Shagari's house, 1966. He walked down that road. That house is still there till date. That's the house that he was when he was Minister of Finance. Mm. It was when he became president that I think either some Julius Bajor or somebody of the federal government built him a house. I searched for where Tafar Baliwa was living when he was alive. I can't find a four-story building. Mm. So people learned how to lead by example, mm. by first of all, not stealing. Mm. They didn't have a very materialistic or mercantile or pecuniary instinct that made them a mass wealth. What would somebody do with $4 billion? What would somebody do with $1 billion naira? As a woman, you have a husband who provides for you. Whatever. In fact, it's not... I'm very conservative at those <laughs> levels. It's not your headache to go and look for one billion naira. <laughs> Let your husband who brought you, yeah. the religions state that they should provide for you. Yeah. So why would you go and steal a billion naira? Then don't bother the men. What, what, what do you do with five billion naira? So we need to begin to, and I'm very happy. That brings me to the point where renewed hope comes in now. And the actions taken by President Tinubu in the last few months over issues of corruption and corruption related issues nobody has been proven guilty yet nobody has been indicted nobody has been taken to jail as per some of the current issues that started from may 29 but we can see evidences that he wants to rule by making sure that those that are with him provide the leadership that leadership of disincentive mm. not to steal and the moment all, all this stuff we're talking about, he came out, the president came out with a policy that you cannot travel with more than four. And we have non-state actors with Mopole, about four trucks of Mopole, mobile policemen, and a convoy. A businessman is traveling and he has 14 cars, just traveling. And out of those policemen who are supposed to be protecting the masses belong to him in his convoy. So all those values have to be jettisoned. And the president has done the right thing. Choose very few things first. Leadership by example. Insist that people around you show capacity to turn their eyes away from the, as a DG, that is enough for you to have privileges. My, my entertainment allowance as a DG was about 30,000 naira per month. Then. 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 We know you So, it. <laughs> so, so, so today, so uh, leadership by example, extremely important. The followership will come. Everybody here, um, uh, Mazio uh, Osita has said leadership must be provided because we have good followership. That's Dr. Ibuzo has said that yes. whatever happens, the, the followership is there and now the lifestyle charter has tried to bridge Okay, that's, that. that, that's why I want to ask, because uh, I, I want us to take it, you know, uh, systematically. That's why I want us to um, extract the values yeah. that define the concept of patriotism yeah. and, and, and probably uh, situate it within, you know, the different generational, you know, uh, uh, you know gaps, yeah. you know, yeah. and identify where the gap. Is from. Maybe I'll start with you again and then go around. We must, first of all, go back to the dignity of labor. We cannot imagine that because your son comes to you and says, Mommy, I want to marry a young lady. And you say to him, you say, where does her parents come from? Where is she working? And she says, no, she's a nurse in one local hospital in the village. I say, no, 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 no. Can't you see your mates are marrying the daughters of governors? Can't you see? The dignity of labor must be respected. Our traditional rulers cannot afford to collect money from crooks, people who have embezzled monies, people who have done things. Our churches and mosques cannot glorify 
and romanticize with those who have illegal sources of funding. Mm. There are lots of everywhere you see funds all over the places that you cannot account for. You don't know how they got those monies. And unless we stop glorifying this wealth, our kids will always love to go and see the big life they see on TV that has romanticized what Europe is like. When they get there, they discover they have to sleep on the street. Yeah. So we must continue, we must start of all, dignity of labor. We must mm -hmm. get back to the value. You can be a mechanic and still be recognized. We've seen in the last few years, people who found money, returned the money, were given national honors. Mm -hmm. We must begin to emphasize those things. If you say today that you're a lecturer, People, Dr. Dr. Iguzo, what are you doing? You are still lecturing. What are you doing? There's no money there. <laughs> what are you doing? And then they will go, uh, you are lecturing. A uh, lecture must come in, smart down for you. Uh, come, let's go and do business. Let's go and. and what is that business? That business is something that has some crooked legs. Mm. So we don't need to. We need to, first of all, take out the base. The base is that desire to make money through any means. Let me, let me okay. pause you. Okay. I'm bringing a uh, uh, Mazi Kechiku. Where is the place of leadership in patriotism? A leadership could yeah, be... Before, before mm. you even begin to talk about the place of leadership in patriotism, uh, there is something that Dr. Bako said which is very vital, which is the issue of, you know, the value, the value system, not placing too much emphasis on money. There was one video that I saw yesterday. I don't know if you saw or you also saw it. I saw this 10-year-old uh, uh, boy celebrating birthday, and another 10-year-old or nine spraying bundles of Naira. You saw it. It's so, I mean, it's so disheartening. I mean, the, 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 how much we have placed, you know, money above, you know, everything in this country. So how do we begin to change this orientation, this mindset? Because it's very, very, very vital. Demola, remember also that the kids are not the ones that got the money. Exactly. So the money is coming from their parents. Their parents, that why their parents that were actually rejoicing. That is why I say you know, leadership is very critical. Yes. It is, it is leadership, so, it is so leadership. I saw it and you know, it was like, weeping. Like, like, you, like, you, like you said, we must provide enabling environment. And one of those enabling environments to engender patriotism yeah. is leadership. Is the quality of leadership that you know we give to our generation? I agree with you, but also remember that leadership is segmented. Mm. It's not only political leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Those who are the board of uh, the First Bank of Nigeria, they don't know about tribe. You enter as a, a board member of the First, of, uh, First Bank of Nigeria, you meet a real man as an evil. You forgot that he's Yoruba. They're talking about profit. Mm -hmm. You are in the MTM board or Grow board or here. You forget about that. So let us be very conscious of what happened. Back in 1986, the IMF program in what is called the Washington Consensus introduced a program where they said government had no business in business mm. that the private sector will do this they will do that that our drawback is because we have hit the states with a lot of responsibilities yes it worked in advanced countries of the world but we did not have the requisite private sector strength to undertake that journey. That journey, the neoliberal concept, is what led us to where the money is placed ahead. As Kodna said, we are hostels. Where our beddings are dressed for us Absolutely. when you go to classes. Absolutely. There was a time. They said if you have anything to do in the campus, you should let the dean of student affairs to know why you are staying back. And some of us wrote that way, we are staying back. So we got to the interview to know why you are back. The dean said, Mr. Kechuku, you are here to political science. What project did you write you are doing? 
I came from that department. Year two, there's no project. I was honest enough to tell him that, sir, the campus is better than where I'm going. <laughs> he said, that, hell yes, I can uh, accommodate that. So how do you do the functions in the village? I said, I can use the bus room I have in my pocket, transport myself to the village, finish by weekend, I'll be back to campus. So, he said honest. Mm. So you are growing with an allegiance to a state that looked after you. Yeah. When I'm growing and bringing boys up and girls with an allegiance to the state, we forgot that where those new liberal policies succeeded, there was also a safety net. That in England today, if I'm in England, I'm above 60, I will not be paying for to, to enter the train or even to access medical health. Yeah. Those things are not here. And so we must try to also do mm. a little flexibility in managing those neoliberal ethos. Because the inequality of the states mm have become so wide because this middle point are forgotten. When we went into privatization of something like electricity, in 2013 or thereabout, one of those who work in the Bureau uh, of Public Enterprise caught my attention. He said they are about giving to electricity to those who are not qualified. We understand the local banks are backing them. They didn't come with the foreign investors who thought they are coming with. Then I was the spokesperson of the Conference on Nigerian Political Parties. So we went to the media. I said, it happened. So what did they call our attention? They said, can you imagine the workers, Nigerian workers in the so-called Nepal then, allowed the infrastructure of Nepal to degenerate. We can't continue pumping money. We're trying to give it away. Mm. We said we're not against that. We understand that those who are going to pick it, we didn't see those foreign investors they told us about. So even today, I'm happy when President Tinubu and the economic team are going around the world and also having some good notes that foreign direct investment in responding to the economic policy that Tinubu had churned out. So when that happened, we would be in a good stead, but that, that should not make us to forget that we still, the state needs still to look into those yeah. who are on the other edge. Mm -hmm. Because if you leave majority of the people mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. The insecurity will continue. Mm -hmm. You develop my content that could have been avoided. So you said about leadership. Mm -hmm. leadership that's, that's about, let, let, outside I'm the sorry. government, she's doing yes. well. Yes, I'm sorry. Because Those you are managing the, the private schools, universities and private uh, secondary schools. They are doing well. Mm -hmm. they are it, you know, there. You, know, you, talk, you there. talked about inequality. You, you mentioned inequality you know, in, in, in your response. And I, I, I just want to say that as long as democracy is the fulcrum of capitalism, there will bound to be class inequality. Even in other climes, in developed democratic climes, you have this inequality in existence. But what closes the inequality is, you know, the, the people, the, the level of patriotism in the people to also build you know, and contribute to the development of their various societies. If you discover from the, uh, the founding fathers of Nigeria, for instance, the uh, Satafa, Baliwa, the, the Saldana, Amadu Bello, the Zikiways, and, and, all, and, and all of them, had one purpose. They fought for the independence of this country. They fought for the nationalism of this country, regardless. But today, the very political elite that is supposed to sustain this temple are the same ones that tell you Nigeria 
It's a mere geographical entity. You know. So when you have this class of people that we are supposed to look up to, having this mentality, how does that engender, you know, the patriotism in the coming generation? Okay. You know, OTV. Okay. I, I think that we must not run into the danger of monocausality and single solution. Monocausality. I like to take that yes. down. Yes. We must and not run solution. into the danger of saying that, you know, um, it's one single thing that has caused our problems. Okay. That's just one. And then one single thing will be the solution. One, Secondly, one side fits off. Yes. <laughs> Secondly, it is not true hmm. that it's patriotism of citizens that reduces inequality. Hmm. It is not true at all. Society is structured in different ways. And the way production is managed, the policies who controls production, how is economy arranged, is what leads to inequality or not. So, for instance, the kind of policies you put in place, you know, that's why I've always said that, look, we are not in 1960. Mm. We are not even in 1970. We are 2024. The level of knowledge across the world today is huge. Mm. The concept of inequality is well defined. And what causes inequality is known. What can be done to reverse inequality is known. Let's come back home. In Nigeria, for instance, in the recent history, throughout the regime of uh, Ulusegu and Basanjo, there was economic growth mm -hmm. of about 6 to 8%. But what happened? At the same time, inequality was increasing. Poverty was increasing. Exactly because of uh, partly neoliberal policies mm. that was introduced. When you introduce neoliberal policies that say market determines, yeah. no subsidy, no targeted intervention for the poor and excluded, no improvement in public services like public education, public health, what you see is increase in poverty. Mm. Now, in 1980, the poverty rate in Nigeria was about 20%. Now, since then, there has been economic growth, produce more billionaires. Mm. I, I, I think there must be a caveat. Not only in Nigeria, it's global. It's global. Eh? As far back as 19, uh, 2012, 65 richest people in the world, 65, have wealth that is more than half of the world's population. Yeah. By 1998 UNDP report, hmm. three of the richest people in the world, three, one, two, three, have assets that is more than the gross domestic product of 48 countries. Wow. So, how do you reduce inequality? First, policy. Policy science has developed to such an extent that when you bring the policy, you can determine who will benefit, whether the rich, the middle class or the lower class. So you can use policy to reduce inequality. Two, taxes. You can use progressive taxation. You can imagine what will happen to only Abuja if all the 
big houses in Abuja are taxed. Nigeria is one of the countries in the world that you have the lowest number of people paying taxes. Mm. And it's also a result of the political economy of oil. Countries that have natural resources don't will bother about taxes. <laughs> you go to Delta State, for instance. If you go to Delta State, for instance, my state, you know, they don't talk to development partners. Development partner, you go to a kitty state, they are calling development partners. Because the budget of a kitty state for 2023 was 113 billion. The budget of Delta State was 726 billion. You know, Dr. Tive, I, I don't want us to really deviate from. No, that's the, that's the, that's the, because, no, excuse yes, me, that's the so, point I'm making yes. that there's no monocasual no, no explanation. There are a number of things that are responsible. And so, as a country, if we want to reinvent Nigeria, we must have first, first, a holistic approach. That's why I think that one of the first things we must do is to return to Nigeria Agenda 2050 okay. and see how. I know that this kind of discussions are not uh, because of time. So yeah, we yeah. want no time. Yes. It's a mindset. Yes. Yes. You know, we want bullets. What will we do? But I'm saying that there's no silver bullet. Okay, let me let me put okay. you on hold and because you you you, you talked I, when I said patriotism can, you know, uh, and, and help to bridge inequality. It might not be a direct consequence. It, it, it can indirectly, you know, help to do that. And, and uh, m my mindset is going towards, for instance, if you diligently carry out your responsibilities and you, you know, stop the co co corruption, if, if you are head of a, a parastata, for instance, you, you know, do your job diligently and you do not, you know, steal from the national coffers. If money is saved, government will have enough funds, you know, to plow into other, on, other areas. And when that is done, the people will be empowered. And when you are empowered, you know, you, 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 you can do or invest and you know take care of your uh, of, of yourself but if that is not done and people continue to steal from the federal coffers you know that is corruption now government does not have much to you know money to carry out its responsibilities of course a lot of people will be deprived will be marginalized yeah. and therefore you know uh, uh, patriotism will cease so indirectly patriotism engenders, I mean, helps to uh, close the inequality gap and engender patriotism. But let us also look at how, you know, um, we, we, we are moving away from, you know, our, our love for our country. If you go to the social media today, you will, you will see all sorts of abuses, people saying all sorts of things about Nigeria. And sometimes I I, I, I've had to enter, you know, to caution a lot of people. You don't come on the internet and you are saying things about your own country. It, it doesn't reflect, you know, uh, uh, that patriotism. When the national anthem is played, for instance, you find some people sitting down. I don't see that happening elsewhere. When the national anthem is played, uh, 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 is taken, you find people are just, you know, like a daisy tell about it. What do we do? How do we restore these virtues in our people? First of all, um, there is no gain saying the fact that the absence of social justice has also precipitated the, the fractious nature in between ethnic fault lines and uh, capacities. There are people who still feel they're not Nigerian yes. because of the way they have been treated. Right. Now, um, because of the way they have been treated, either deliberately or, you know, the dysfunctional level that doesn't allow them to see themselves. And if you watch, there's an exodus that normally takes place from certain minorities. They find it more convenient to be abroad than to stay here and be emasculated mm -hmm. mentally, psychologically, politically, mm -hmm. socially, because they don't belong. Now, um, there are those who, uh, Claire, uh, Demola, there are people who still complain that 
social justice started by the time you're still talking about three major tribes what happens to the people who are mm -hmm. fermi mm -hmm. people who are uh, margi in borno state people who are who are dakarikari in zuru state so the mere fact that you have allowed three tribes to be ahead makes the rest feel that is either we connect with these three tribes or we lose our sense of belonging. nationalism of belonging to this country that social justice requires a leader that will show by practical examples that where you come from and the status of your tribe does not matter whether you like it or not there are levels and strata of respect even in an Ambra state even in the southeast there are parts of Igbo that consider the people from the northern part as well as second class Igbos even within Yorubas there are people who still think that the Yoruba ethnic sensitive originality precludes some of the people from Badagri some people from other parts that are northern Yoruba. Same even with Hausas and uh, Fulanis. Then I, look, within Fulanis, we have Toronkawas who came to Nigeria before even before even uh, Shehu's Mandan Fodio. We have we have so many of those ethnic cleavages, and that ranking makes certain people feel that they don't belong to the first class. So when you are going to a state, sometimes a governorship candidate comes, three or four of them, they tendency to market the one that is more ethnic Igbo or the more ethnic whatever puts certain people down the line. And remember that we had a president who came from Bielsa who is not exactly people that's when I began to hear that oh he just have category. <laughs> the Ijos from this Ijo are different from the Ijos that are Otuoke. They are different from and I said what's all this? Now we must begin to learn how to diffuse and to delineate all of those things and put Nigeria first. Is that part of what this lifestyle charter? Actually, some, something, some, some, someone says something. He said, he, said, he said the problem, our problem actually begins with historical review, concluding that the foundation of Nigeria were faulty from the start. You see, that's, with that's no the agreement matter. made towards nationhood by the federating unit. Instead, of, instead Nigeria's different ethnic nationalities held themselves in mutual suspicion even in content before independence. That's, that's exactly that's, what Yes, that's about. where we are now. Yes. Rather than yes. rather than be lie and be cry and be moan all of that now, we want we to move to forward. Yeah. So I'll tell you Claire, as 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 Director General of MBC, MBC. I employed about two hundred people and uh, not one is my relation. One single one hmm. is my relation. As Director General of NBC, I gave out close to about 40 licenses for radio and TV. I do not have my name anywhere or any of my relations in any of those things because I believed that I must lead by example. Okay. So I have said when Mazio Sita was talking about leadership, leadership at the presidential level, Dr. Ibuzo mentioned it, is at that political level. Beyond that, below yeah. that, there is another level of leadership that even comes down to community level. Precisely. How do they carry out their functions and do they, do they create social justice even within that community level? A small village in Gwagolada, you will discover that the Gwari that is in Gwagolada might tell you that that Gwari is superior to Gwandara. Dr. Bako, let me just in interject you there. Just hold your thoughts there. We'll take a break to the program good morning nigeria and we are discussing how we can uh reinvent our country nigeria just before we went on the short break dr dan ladibako was uh, of course responding to uh, a question dr dan ladibako will allow you to quickly uh, conclude your thought and then we'll just escalate the conversation from the nuances and provisions of what we have in nigeria today the desire and our effort to get an egalitarian society, both in terms of thought, word, and deed, uh, attempt to play down political differences, build a social structure that allows everybody to feel 
part of the country. A lot of the reasons why people want to go out sometimes is that they feel the opportunities available to them are not as clear as those. You will find people write on the social media that, oh, somebody got 180 in jam. Yeah. He gets admission where somebody with 350 did not get admission. Those, those inequalities must disappear. There must be equal opportunities for everybody, irrespective of where you come from. That will now spur you on to defend your country. To defend your country. Um, going back to Super Eagles, I was in Ghana when Aloy Agu, Super Eagles yes. were playing Ghana, when Aloy Agu lost his teeth in Kumasi. Hmm. And it took about a year for the NFA and people to provide money for mm -hmm. him to replace, to replace his teeth. teeth. You don't fight for a country like that. Mm. A man goes to uh, fight bandits in Katsina and is killed, and nobody talks to his family, oh, nobody yeah. does anything, nobody even visits his family. Meanwhile, maybe the president of the country is somewhere else. The, 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 the state governor is not anywhere, mm -hmm. you know. So you don't feel like a country. You don't feel like part of a country. You don't want to sweat for that country. Uh, so we must begin to identify those gaps and begin to take care of them. Otherwise, the level of patriotism will continue to wait. I'm sure you remember Dr. Ibu talked about once upon a time. That was when all of us were pretty patriotic. All of us felt it in our veins, Nigeria. Yeah. I think also that this current generation have adopted Niger yeah. as, uh, you know, yeah. whatever, so the, the, the slang. Uh, the slang. Mm. I think we can use that to make them feel much more after providing the safety nets for now for now there are not enough safety nets the government provided palliatives those palliatives have just disappeared nobody has an idea where those palliatives disappeared to from the state governors it took us some time to go and break into warehouses to take out food for people during answers because yeah. that political elite we still come back to the what uh, the neoliberal policies that created a vacuum some people see romanticize and feel that socialism should not have died mm. communism should not have died because of the effect mm. and ultimate ramifications of neoliberal policies Absolutely. from so, the western world okay. Okay. okay okay thank you thank you very much dr bako uh, uh, Baz uh, wanted to respond to the, the okay. 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 All right. yes i said the young man that said we have the wrong foundation is not correct there used to be an austrian top diplomat called Matnik. Then he told the Italian ambassador that why should, it, why should Italy talk when Italy is so divided that sooner or later Italy will be out of the globe. No country will be called it Italy. It didn't take a long time. The Austria he represented was six states today. <laughs> six yes. countries, German, so Austria, this and that. So no country on earth that is not a geographical expression. It's yeah. true. Even the United States will eulogize. They have to bargain to get Texas. They have to even pay money to get Alaska. Mm -hmm. So the question of telling us that what happened to us is because we are official. Nothing is very wrong. As Bako said, what in the Igbo states? That's a subdivision. In my town, a, a, a town of about 100, 200,000, I don't know whether I want to 200,000. Or, by real history, one parentage, by 9% Catholics, hmm. the Christendom, they had a primary ruler. When he died, the son succeeded him. Hmm. When the son died in 1998, they don't village that in the second set of, okay, said is their turn. Very few of us from where the Pamarula came from, the village, we are bold enough to say we are supporting them too, also, let there be rotation. Because by then we're also talking about the rotation convention in Nigeria. We said, why can't we come back to the village and say there won't be rotation? The principle of inclusiveness. Since 1998, mm, mm. that town is divided along that line. One language, 
parentage. One parentage or religion. So let's know that what submit to us is what do I yeah. have going on? Okay. Inclusion. Whether at the local council level, at the state or federal, if you want to make a choice, please place competence above your own kinsman. Okay. Above your religion. They said they were debating about the 1999 constitution. And I was telling them, I said that constitution, if well implemented, had no fault line. Yeah. That in chapter two, the constitution stated the fundamental objectives and directed principles of state policy. Mentioned what can bring the social justice Kogna was talking about. What can bring the humanity? Yeah. That the primary purpose of government is the welfare of the people and the security Spiritual. of the people. And they said, no, it's not justiciable. Senior lawyers. <laughs> One of those days I met Fallon and they were discussing. Fallon said, you see, what's your own viewpoint? I said, going through the same constitution, if you want to take a note as a president of the country, the old, in one of the lines of the, the oath you are taking says you must preserve mm -hmm. and protect that fundamental objectives Two and principles. the principles of state policy. You want to be a governor, the same thing. You want to be a senator, the same thing. You want to be a parliamentarian, the same thing. I said, if you are taking an oath to protect and preserve an item, and you say it is not justiciable, I'm not a lawyer. But by that oath, it shows that the president, the governor, the local council chairman, the senator, the parliamentary, either at the state level or the federal, should look into that fundamental objective okay. of state policy. It goes to the extent of telling us that the Nigerian economy should be managed in such a manner that not few people or group will dominate the production and the exchange processes. Or are we saying that we are so bad that if we, are, we show transparency in our leadership that people will not understand? Masi, Masi, we, ha we have so, to stop so, here because okay. we are running out of time. We, 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 we have to so yes. Inclusion, yeah. transparency. Yes, let's quickly look okay. at the content yeah, of the national Sir, I, I, lifestyle. I want to come to you, Dr. Ibuzo. Mm. Uh, someone said something. He said, patriotism is not blind loyalty to government. It is the love and commitment towards building a better nation for all. And, you know, earlier on... Very correct. Yes, yes very, very correct. And, you, you know, earlier on you talked about the issue of inequality and all that. Of course, in every society there will always be inequality one way or the other. Even, uh, even in the 60s, where we had so much commitment, when Dr. Bako was talking about, you know, uh, the Tafawa Balewa, the Amadu Bello, and the uh, Azikwe, and Awolowo. But, you see, there were inequalities in, 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 at, at that time. But the commitment of the people in government was so obvious that you know nigerians were very very patriotic now how do we begin because we have you talk about the need for us to have policy or holistic you know policy that will address this issue now going about this uh, this uh, what's it called now? National, the national lifestyle charter now how do you intend because how, how what what how what way in what in, in which way is that we can have this commitment, you know, in Nigerians. Okay, so uh, your questions have several prongs. Yeah. <laughs> I think the first thing to note, mm. that like I've stated earlier, is that look, we are where we are as a result of several reasons. Yeah. Including colonialism, mm. including military rule, including political economy of oil. Because the other countries, Angola, Kazakhstan, they face similar issues that we face, including issues of politics, including the mistakes we made in 1999, transition to civil rule. Mm. So there are a lot of reasons that have led to where we are today. Now, on 
questions of patriotism and how we can reinvent Nigeria through the National Values Charter. It is very clear. And I think that, for me, I think it's one of the most profound initiatives that this administration has taken. Because our problems are well known to everyone. Mm. You know. Every politician promises to deal with these problems. Deal with security, education, mm. health, food, infrastructure, health, security. Infra every politician. But why is it mm. that it's not translated into reality? In spite of the humongous resources and that the come to the country through the grace of God that has endowed us with abundant resources, resources especially oil, that we just sell and get the money. Not even through taxation that the state or government extracts resources from the people. One fundamental reason. Mm. Is the value system so what is this charter all yes. about and yes yes this charter is different in several fundamental ways one it has both commitment from government and commitment for citizens two there is an accompanying policy and implementation strategy that will ensure that it's well implemented. Three, it adopts a whole of society approach that it will involve all levels of government, ministries, departments, and agencies, and even other sectors, civil society, religious sector, a private sector. It will involve changing education. Mm -hmm. It will involve bringing policies. I just hope that the government will take it seriously. Now, who, who benchmarks performance, you know, and, and outcome? Uh, because if you have a charter where you have all the, you know, uh, the provisions yes. of government, First, yes, because performance the, the, is... You key. asked about the content of yes. the charter. Yes. There are seven promises by government uh, uh, to give to the people. Number one, equality, that everybody is equal before the law. Hmm. Two is democracy, that we have chosen this level. That is what we are going to utilize. Three is entrepreneurship and employment, to provide a living environment for employment and entrepreneurship to thrive in Nigeria. Four, peace and security, to ensure that government provides peace and security. Five is inclusivity, and I think Rosita uh, mm -hmm. uh, has talked a lot about Six is freedom and justice for everyone. So no matter where you come from, like uh, uh, Dala Dibako has, uh, to, and then seven is meritocracy, that decisions, appointments will be made by merit. I, I'm, I'm sorry. For the citizens. Yes. yes. Seven yes. for the citizens. One is discipline. Two is duty of care. That we are our neighbor's keeper. Three is tolerance and respect. Not just tolerance. I tolerate you for your region, but respect. Okay. Respect you. Then four is leadership and patriotism. Five is transparency, accountability, and integrity. Six is family value and environmental awareness. And then seven, dignity of labor, resilience, and self-reliance. It is envisaged okay. that the implementation will involve every sector that there will be new policies new laws to be in line with this there will be civic education there will be engagement cultural initiatives films uh, documentaries that will show all of this because we've seen mm. that no nation can develop unless the values align with 
what the people say. We have, we have just we have two minutes <laughs> more, and I would like uh, okay, uh, Dr. Daniel Debako, you're part of the review of this new national life charter. How do states uh, 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 expect to impact on the processes of government and, of course, the, the MBAs? The National Orientation Agency is the house where is the, is the warehouse of all of these and it set up this committee that Dr. Ibuzo was part of and uh, I was part of the NTA team that conceptualized Andrew those days yes and uh, Jimiate, myself, Clement, Uwadie all of us, 1984, and 85. Don't come back. Is that, is that it? No, checking out. Checking yeah, out. Checking out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I was, I was right there. I was controller enlightenment mm. at that time in NTA. Um, so it is part of a review committee to distill all of these uh, items on the charter and the value system to now translate them into symbols that can be consumed okay. by okay. the viewers. Because whatever you say, all of us sitting in this room are very media sensitive or we are part of a media superstructure that have the duty to make sure that we use the media for this purpose. Whatever we say, eventually when we talk about poor leadership, etc., the media should be in the forefront of carrying the message because the volume of people, close to 49 million people on the internet, the close to once upon a time 30 million NTA viewers, if we cannot use those platforms to change our mindset, mm -hmm. then we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And I did behavioral change communication in my PhD, so I know that it is part of the media's duty to evolve structures, symbols, that will help use platforms that will change these mindsets. Thank and you. whenever, Thank when you. a guy like Hitler asks people to come out and go to war, <laughs> when people like Jim Jones, Guyana, mm -hmm. tragedy, make people to commit suicide because he said so, what did, what did he do? He just walked on their psychology. So we must, as public broadcaster and as NTA, your duty here goes beyond jingles. You must be in the forefront, not just NTA, all the media houses. As a former DG of NBC, I should be able to motivate those media houses to get involved Thank in you. moving Thank 200 you. million and, Nigerians and that's forward. that's precisely Thanks. why we, we, we are, you know, we came up with this with, program. With this, with this program. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bako, for you. uh, your robust uh, contribution to uh, today's uh, uh, discussion, Reinventing Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Ba Danladi Bako is the Koguna of Sao Koto and a former Director General National Broadcasting Commission and former Commissioner of Information in Sao Koto State and a veteran journalist. And the, first, so and the first to have a <laughs> cup of tea <laughs> on a live show. Also, we have uh, 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 Mr. Osita Okechiko, former Director General of Vaughan. Thank you so much for coming. And Dr. Otiv Ibuza, former Deputy Chief of Staff of former Deputy Senate President, and also is the one of the committee academics put together by the Honorable Minister of uh, Information and National Orientation to draw various sectors to fine tune and perfect the National Lifestyle Charter, which will soon be unveiled by the President. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibuza. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it. Well, well it's now time to uh, take a sports report.